Faith Middleton here with your welcome toast. Dieting is when you eat food that makes you sad. Listen to our show in small bites or enjoy the whole thing. I got that sunshine in my pocket. Got that good soul in my feet. I feel that hot blood in my body when it drops. I'm Faith Middleton with the gang, and what a show we have for you. We're doing this show in the kitchen at the Hartford Healthcare Bone and Joint Institute. That's at Hartford Hospital, because later in the show, we're going to find out whether the food we eat actually helps us heal faster, keeps down inflammation, which is the new bad guy. We're also going to try to get to some phenomenal food tips for you to make your cooking life easier and more fun. Now, you might think it's hard to cook a whole fish on the grill. I did until I experienced this on Labor Day weekend. Uh, I was at Marianne (laughs) Wilde, Diane Bradger's house, and we did this together. It was absolutely so amazing, so easy, seven-pounder. It's on our Facebook site, Faith Milton Push Moves. Wow, that's a big Let let me say it. more than seven. I am (laughs) with my darling food buddies. So we are talking about Chris Brasberry and Alex Province, the senior contributor, senior producer Robin Doyen Aiken. It is her birthday today. Happy birthday to you. you. <laughs> you promised you'd never sing again on the show, so just saying. Wow. <laughs> well, That's you. to me. You got Alex. complaints? <laughs> but we, th- we think we're so lyrical. <laughs> okay. Feedback. So Food Schmooze Wellness is coming your way. Okay, why do a whole fish on the grill? I have a theory, Chris and everybody, why not? that the bones inside the fish, when they're in there, just like bone-in meat, Mm -hmm. it it Mm -hmm. flavors the flesh of the fish in a way that makes it so amazing. Is it true, Chris, or am I making this up? Yeah, probably a little bit, but to me, it's more you don't have to take those little bones out. Mm -hmm. It's when the fish is cooked, it's so much easier to bone it, right? You just pull the bones right out. On our trip to Spain, my uncle fries this beautiful fish, and then Mm -hmm. we asked him why he kept the bones in, and he's like, it's all for flavor. So, Mm -hmm. You know, just like a piece of steak. Mm. Alex, when you do your baby snappers Mm -hmm. and fish for them, I love that. I I love to eat those. Do you bone them or Mm -hmm. do you just leave them in? Because they're so soft. They're so soft you can almost eat them. I think it even if they they give you calcium. So no, for (laughs) real. No, I I don't know. Choke on it. I don't know if that's (laughs) safe. So we're we're not taking a position on that. Okay. Um, So here's. Here's like a cat. It, but I want to um, know, where did the fish come from? Did you guys catch it? Or, no, that was a went, big to, fish. went to the fish market the fish and market said, and scale it, clean it. There are six people. We yep. need a seven pounds. But I bet it was caught that day yeah. where yeah. you Absolutely. are. Absolutely. Yeah. The eye was so yeah. crystal clear. You yeah. could tell. So here's how ours went and see if you have a different technique. The cavity, it's been cleaned out and it's been scaled head on. We want it mm-hmm. because there's beautiful meat in the cheeks. Mm-hmm. So Marianne. Inside the cavity, put sliced lemons and oranges and limes. You could put some fresh herbs in there. For instance, lemon thyme would be gorgeous yes. inside there. So then a piece of foil, aluminum foil, goes down on the grill top. N- no that. oil on nope. it, nothing, just the foil. Just drop it on. And on the foil, she put more slices of lemons and limes and oranges. Jeez. And then puts the fish on top of those, so it is just like a raft. Uh, it's like a raft. A little Chris, white wine? Not no, a thing. Mean it. No, no. Oh. On the grill, you just you drank it all. Yeah. That no, thing, yeah, just, just like that. But that's the best way to grill a whole fish. Okay, mm-hmm. then she slips the, you know, puts yeah. the fish right on top of there, yeah. and oh, here is the key. The key is that on the top side of the fish. Mm-hmm. She makes a deep slit sure. every, I would yeah. say, three, four inches so mm-hmm. that you've got a good little mm-hmm. three, four inch yeah. slab in mm-hmm. front of you because the heat goes in there yeah. and it cooks through that way. So I then, like putting garlic in those little slits, little oh, sliced garlic. really good go on, idea. Go That's just so good. Little um, slivers of garlic? Oh, yeah, just put little through. slivers of garlic. You can put little pieces of lemon in each little slit, too. Okay, All right, excellent. So, so that's it. Yeah. And she just cooks it Drop the lid. till the fish is done. To my recollection, it took yeah. us about 40, yeah, 45 medium minutes. Meat. And you see it when it starts flaking and yeah. it's so opaque, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes, she just yeah. did a little fork thing. Here was the best part. She takes the fish, puts it onto a baking sheet. Nothing, no fancy yeah. platter. Yeah. She walks out to the people in the dining room and yeah. she says, 
because she's going to carve it in the kitchen right next yeah, door. Okay. So she said, I just wanted to see, oh, want you to see yeah. the fish that has just come off the grill. And then went around like in a mm. French restaurant yeah. <laughs> showing this whole fish oh, with the, the head on. the aromas of the oh, lemon. It and was the swoon material. Yeah. Oh. So if yeah. you want a lot of wows at the yeah. table, this is, this is a thing Especially to do. Especially a seven-pound fish. Exciting. Really exciting. Now, look. We're doing our show at the Bone and Joint Institute at Hartford Hospital, and we're in their kitchen. We're going to talk to them in depth in a bit about f the connection between food and inflammation and all the joint you know, injuries that everybody has, including me. I have a, a rib injury. Um, so when I'm not reading cookbooks at night, I am <laughs> testing recipes, I'm reading online, I'm reading print editions of magazines and newspapers, and I'm online reading blogs. And what we're doing is collecting information that we think is excellent. So mm. we're curating the best of the best. So we've got some great tips coming your way before we get to the doctor here, Dr. Lewis, Cortland Lewis, here at the hospital. He's chief of, of all things, <laughs> and he loves wine. So we're going to um, have him join us when we test the most delicious red wine. Thank you, Alex. Okay, I'm going to start with Robin because it's her birthday. <laughs> um, okay, Robin, what is your tip? And this is, this is Food Network. Go ahead. Okay, so I love this one because it is kind of like a twofer. It's one tip. There's one little technique that our tipster does, but the benefits are two. So... When you're baking, if you're baking a chocolate cake, instead of dusting your cake pan with flour, she dusts it with cocoa powder. Oh, like so oh, I know. Genius. So here's the double benefit. Number one, more chocolate and cocoa is just always a good thing. Who would That's very more helpful. Chocolate? Yeah. Helpful. Helpful. That's what I was thinking. And yes. then, you know, when you're done baking your cake and you take it out of the pan, if you've dusted with all-purpose flour, it's you all have, white, yeah. yeah, there's yeah. that white stuff. So if you're baking a chocolate cake and you dust your pan with cocoa powder, making it nonstick, mm. you don't have that white flour. And I don't want to yeah. taste flour. Yeah. yeah. Why would I yeah. want that? So okay, let's is, go around the table. So right Alex up. Promise, this is um, from Cook's Illustrated, folks. Right up my alley they did a test to find out the best way to sanitize a sponge and they microwave bleach froze them boiled them and it turns out that the two best ways are the microwave and then boiling it but the problem with microwaving it is microwaves get so hot that yeah. sponges can catch on fire. Mm. So they really? default to boiling a sponge to get it nice and clean. And my, uh, like sponges that. now yeah. have that scrubby thing, which yeah, yeah. is some kind of, I don't know, plastic. Yeah. And, and it smells sizzles. and it sizzles. Yeah. And I think that's really boiling unhealthy. Water. So good. And Chris, you use that technique in your kitchen, restaurant kitchen. Yeah. So this I have this tip here from Cook's Illustrated. Okay, go. Also. Yep. But we don't boil. What we do is we actually use this solution that they're suggesting. It's a sanitized bleach solution and it's a tablespoon of bleach in a quart of water mm. one tablespoon of bleach yep that's so little and so yet little. bleach is so powerful mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in a quart of water you in would think water. what does that so do you're making yeah. a solution that basically kills all bacteria they suggest it's the best way to clean a sink so you would take your sponge and you could put it in there but you could just wipe your sponge down you and then pour that down the drain as well and that cleans everything you know there are people in the world who love to uh, make a living scaring people because mm -hmm. they get lots of eyeballs or they get lots of people tuning in um, you know like how many germs are in your hotel room yeah. quilt yeah, and, you know the, this this well, little tip that. did come with the the amount of uh, bacteria per square no. inch if you'd so like to do, know that they say the sink <laughs> is the filthiest yeah. thing oh. <laughs> the, okay so anyway um, <laughs> but don't pay, don't, pay don't pay attention to that part <laughs> can i just do this tip it's my absolute favorite because i spend an enormous amount of time after cooking on the stovetop and spattering it with grease my really wonderful wonderful Ariston oh, olive oil. I want to know this one. It splatters After everywhere. The, everywhere. My glasses. And I have a screen <laughs> yeah. that's supposed to shower, help. Shower, oh, it's yeah. the, and then I have to wash the screen. It's a big thing. <laughs> so what do you do? Listen to this tip. To keep the stovetop grease from splattering yeah. onto the unused burners, yeah. and therefore we're cleaning like mad, this guy named Drew Gordon, okay. he writes into Cooks Illustrated, and he went out and he bought inexpensive tiles for a floor, ceramic tiles, uh, and he puts them on, on every burner except the one he's using. 
And what happens is the tiles get sprayed with they the grease. You just throw them in the dishwasher. You put them in the dishwasher with the dishes. I Isn't love that, that idea. Isn't that the best? Yeah. I, I absolutely love it. I'd be cleaning the tile, though. <laughs> God, I get those clean. No, but you put them in the dishwasher. <laughs> right? Okay, Alex, you have one? Quick. This is a good one. We don't use ginger all that often, but if you do need ginger, you just buy it, you put it in the freezer, and then when you need it, you just slice it off the cut end, and then, you know, use what you need, and then put the ginger yeah, back sure. in the freezer. And this way... Yep. On the spur, if you want to cook something with ginger, you have it. You don't have to run it. Instead of how many cut. times are you throwing out the unused ginger? Yeah. Three months later, four months later, when you look you at it, you're like, what's that ginger? What's nothing? that desiccated <laughs> yeah, object? Looks like in something my... died in the, in the drawer. <laughs> <Is> that... <laughs> it shrivels. Okay, Chris, you have, All right, I have another one. Uh, and this was a great one, and I do this one too at the restaurant, just in larger amounts. This is about using tomato paste. And you know how you buy a can of tomato paste, mm -hmm. and the recipe calls, and this annoys me, the recipe calls for a teaspoon? And you're looking at this I can, know. and there's like 30 teaspoons in it. And, and you like, think, well, I'll use this. No, you're but not. You're no, going to put it don't. in the refrigerator. It's going to dry up, and then you're going to throw the whole can away. So that you freeze it. So you take it. When you, when you open it up, use your whatever you're going to use in your recipe, and then freeze it. They suggest in tablespoons. So just put it in tablespoons, put it on a little sheet. And then when it's frozen solid, you can put those and wrap them up in plastic or put them in a bag, and you have these perfectly portioned tomato paste. Is there a container that you could use to put those tablespoons in? Ice cube in? trays. Yeah. Of course. Be a lot yes. though, right? Yeah. Just like my, my basil. Wow. That's that's what yeah. I do with my pesto. Yeah. Okay, I've got an extra one here. I'm into soy sauce. Well, sure enough, Cooks Illustrated said, let's do a tasting of soy sauces. Ooh. So I'm gonna give you the the two tips. And one is a gluten free, so it's a tamari. Yeah. And it's their favorite. And then what regular soy sauce, the one with wheat in it, is their absolute favorite. So let's start with the regular. The regular is Kikoman soy sure. sauce. You've seen the that in the one. supermarket. Sure. Yeah. It's got water and wheat and mm -hmm. soybeans and salt and all this stuff. They thought it was rich and well-balanced and complex and a little bit of caramel mm -hmm. and a sherry-like aroma. That Kikoman soy sauce is for people who don't have to care about wheat, is your number one choice. Agreed. Now, when you go in the supermarket and you're looking for gluten-free uh, tamari, get this because this is the most like even though it doesn't have wheat yeah. and it has a touch of sugar and it's the most like oh, the other soy, soy yeah. sauce yeah. it's the kikoman again okay. those people yeah, are just great gluten-free tamari soy sauce wow. you can't yeah. even tell the difference no, not if you buy so just one. buy the kikoman gluten-free yeah. soy sauce yeah. and you're good yeah. Okay, so as promised, we have a special wine to tell you about. It is organic. It's a Bordeaux that has a kind of loveliness to it that will make it go with so many things, including fish. We're going to get to that in just a minute. Can we say a quick thing about, you'll notice as you drive by farm stands right now, or even in the supermarket if you're in a city, you're going to see that the uh, acorn squash is prominent. Lots oh, of squash, but in my favorite, acorn. So, your favorite, the yeah. acorn? Yeah. Maple it, how syrup, about you? cinnamon, cut in half. In the, I was going to say, what, what yeah. is your best thing to do with it? How do you, how do you like I to like do it? I like wedging it. Tell just us. simple. Just I cut it in half, and then I scoop out the seeds, and then you can even see on the acorn it has the marks where you cut it, right? Because it's yeah. sort of so I cut it into those wedges, and then I put the wedges on a line sheet pan, a little uh, like you were Butter, saying, brown sugar, maple syrup, yeah, brown sugar cinnamon, or maple syrup, and, and I just pop it in the oven, and then everyone gets one. It's the perfect size, right? How do you keep Why it from falling idea? over? Oh, I do it on the edge, and I just I am often not strong enough to. I'm yeah. struggling cutting it even in half. I have a tip for you for that. I have a very uh, sturdy serrated knife. So not mm -hmm. a flimsy one that you can bend back and forward your hand. I have a really heavy one. Mm -hmm. And I saw it. Because I even have trouble, like, cutting through it with a sharp knife. Where do you and get that knife? Henkel makes a good one, you know, a good one. Uh -huh. for they have to be thick stainless steel ones, and you just saw it. Let the knife do the work. What do you put on your acorn squash, Robin? I think similar to a recipe that Alex likes, I like to cut it in half, and then I load it up with a little butter, mm -hmm. maple syrup. I will cook some brown rice separately Ooh. and mm -hmm. have them come together in the end, a little a brown rice salad that I Into the well of yes. the squash? Yeah. Ooh, with all the juices that are in there, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. soaking it up. Maybe oh. some golden raisins, too, sure. would nice. be good there. Oh, yeah. very yeah. good. So it's like a I stuffed squash. And it's half is a meal. Really for yeah. me. Oh, absolutely. And all the beta keratin, really healthy. It is healthy. So for I do you. the I do the same that you do. I put but I put a little butter in there. Some people for health reasons will do olive oil. Mm -hmm. At the very last minute, some people will put nuts in there. 
of chopped all up spice. Mm-hmm. I yeah. put yes. Nutmeg. I I put just a whisper. I mean, an eighth of a teaspoon of brown sugar, Ooh, sure. instead, instead of, of maple, maple syrup. syrup or honey. Yeah. Or, yeah. Oh, it's my mom will wonderful. take squash and put it in her chicken soup. So the same way you'd put chunks of potato, totally. you mm-hmm. can do pumpkin, different kinds oh. of squash. Just peel it Heaven. into big like potato yeah. type chunks. If you use mm-hmm. butternut squash, it's so tender. Sweetness or oh. pumpkin. I oh. love butternut squash. Yes, yeah, yeah, so and too. that's this is the time, right? Start yeah. making How do you soups? cook your butternut squash? I cube it. I, and I like On it in stews. Yeah. So you and I peel like, it. Yeah, I peel it. I cube it, and I love it in stews and chilies and soups i just don't know it, mm-hmm. it's like you don't even need to use meat so if you're doing yeah. a meatless diet you can do something Satiated. like butternut squash because it fills you up it has that meaty kind of texture yeah. to it i always feel like my butternut squash needs help and well, i never can. quite know what to put on it to make it more delicious to Caramel, make it more fun i think like in little yeah. chunks like you do and then you get the sugar and the caramelization on oh a baking i didn't sheet. hear about the sugar <laughs> what do you do? You well, like you can it. use maple syrup, you can use brown sugar, but I, I like to blend it in with like beets and other root vegetables and then on roast a baking them? and roast it. Shake the pan so, you know, good don't idea. get distracted. That, that with the roast chicken for, is right? so good. If oh, you yeah. do it with beets and other vegetables, yeah. then it's just Turn a different and parts. it's a different yeah. note in that symphony I of like roasted that. vegetables. It's oh, so fingerling I'm potatoes. this time of year. Oh, that yeah. sounds good. I'm a fall chef. I know. I you really guys have am. gotten me so in the mood for fall food now. <laughs> yeah. I know. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love and tomato it's... season, but something about fall foods just make me so happy. And you now. know, uh, well, because we've all had so much summer food, I yeah. think, uh, that this season to starts to, <laughs> yeah. you know, we'll be we'll be ruining this later yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, we're at the Bone and Joint Institute at Hartford Hospital in their kitchen. They have a special kitchen here. It's beautiful. It's all mm-hmm. wired up, and Larry Reming is our engineer from Connecticut Public Broadcasting Network. Thank you, Larry. And we have the chief, Dr. Cortland Lewis, joining us to test our new wine with us. And then we're going to just pepper him with all kinds of questions because this place is crawling with orthopedists and nutritionists and rehab people. And all they do is work on these bone and joint issues. And it's something that either people already have in the millions or you're going to have depending on your age. It's like you can't get away from it. And so we're, we've got food, their recipes, unbelievable, a wine to test, all that in our next segment right here on the Faith Middleton Food Schmooze. We'll be right back. Cornbread said, now that's all right. Bean. Meet me on the corner tomorrow night. Bean. I'll be ready. I'll be ready tomorrow night. I'll be ready. I'll be ready tomorrow night. I'll be ready. I'll be ready tomorrow night. That's what Bean said to Cornbread. I'm Faith Middleton. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Food Schmooze. We are at the Hartford Healthcare Bone and Joint Institute. It's at Hartford Hospital. And we have physician in chief, Dr. Cortland Lewis, with us. Besides being a chief of all things here, I mean, this place is so great because running around here, we, there are like a thousand orthopedists and physical therapy people and dietitians and nutritionists. And and amazing nursing staff. The place is gorgeous. It's a facility that exists all by itself. And we're in their kitchen, believe it or not, which is beautifully outfitted. There are even cameras here. So we decided we would do the wine. We would taste the wine right here. And I've cornered Dr. Lewis, who doesn't have surgery or anything today, <laughs> to join us for this for this wine tasting. I'm, of course, with the senior contributors, Chris Prosperi of Metro Beast Restaurant in Simsbury, Connecticut, Alex Province, our wine broker, who lives in Hartford, and Dr. Lewis. Welcome to the Fujimus officially. So glad to have you here. Thank you. Our pleasure, really. So here, let's get to this wine, because okay. it's organic, and we have some food to taste that is Mediterranean-inspired, and the recipes 
are on our website, foodschmooze.org. Alex Robbins, tell us about this wine as we're pouring. So this is the um, Chateau Vieux Pochier 2014 Bordeaux. It is a certified organic Bordeaux, which isn't really easy to find, and it's Malbec, primarily Malbec. So you have these luscious, fun tannins that go really well with food, and there's a little bit of Merlot. To soften it, right? Mm. So in addition to being organic, you're saying the Merlot adds a touch of softness mm -hmm. to the, that big structure of a, of a wine like this, so correct? A lot of Bordeaux is made out of Cabernet. This is not Cab. This mm. is Malbec is the majority of it. And then they use Merlot to soften it. And remember, Bordeaux has you know a left bank and a right bank. So this is on the right bank, and it's just north of a little city called Pomerol. And <laughs> <laughs> la la. la la. That's where they make some really <laughs> absolutely gorgeous wine. And right. this is a tiny producer. Anytime you see on a French bottle chateau, that means it's an actual place. It's not a marketing gimmick. It's an actual place. They grow grapes on only four hectares. So it's a really small little producer. And you want to try it? Yeah, let's, let's yeah, have right. Well, like, first Pouring we have to say to cheers. cheers. Cheers to mm. Dr. Lewis and all the great people here. Thank you. Alex. Ah, okay. My favorite mm. sound in the world. Mm -hmm. mm. So, you know, the tannins are the taste, like when you oh. swallow mm. your teeth, you, you feel that like a little um, texture, mm. right? There's uh -huh. plenty. Mm. So we need a steak. Mm. <laughs> no, I think this eggplant's going to be great. All right, let's mm. try it. With a little cheese yeah. and mm. tomatoes. Oh, my God. Does that work? Mm-hmm. So we're going to get into this question of whether foods really act as anti-inflammatory agents, whether they really do build bone. There's a lot of discussion in the health world about this, right, Dr. Mm. Lewis? So Certainly. we'll come back to that in, in just a second. But... Well, how do you like the wine? It's really you very well. nice. Yeah. Um, and I can honestly say I haven't had any before noon for a while. <laughs> <laughs> At least not since vacation time. <laughs> so, Alex, mm, what would you work. say? We're having this oh, recipe wow. that the, the Bone and Joint Institute gave us. Their folks have created this. And it's um, Mediterranean, so slice of eggplant with a little bit of olive oil brushed on it, a kind of fresh tomato salsa, with a little basil, it looks like, maybe a little bit of cilantro, and some goat cheese mm. sprinkled on. So it has a lusciousness. The eggplant is amazing mm. with a Bordeaux. I would never mm. have had a Bordeaux with it's, this. It's absolutely perfect with this. Like you designed it, Alex. <laughs> I mean, like you really like, we're like, well, I'm, I have this wine, and I'm going to do it with something, and this would be it. And the goat cheese with yeah. one? Oh, yeah. That's perfect. What would you have this with, ideally? So it works with the big flavors of Mediterranean food. I'm obviously thinking about these occasions when we do have steak on the grill. Uh oh, oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, we just couldn't quite manage, uh, you know, something rare this <laughs> this time of day. So, and I have to admit that um, probably all foods are a good fit, but it depends on just how much of it you eat. And uh, is that really the key? Do you think that's the key? I think it really mm. is. I think the the whole concept that uh, we have to exclude things. Obviously, moderation is the key concept, and yeah, I don't think there are any rules. Do you think diets work? I really don't think diets work. I've okay. been an orthopedic surgeon for 33 years, and I can't even tell you how many folks have tried and tried and been on a diet, and the recidivism rate is so high mm -hmm. that it really is a lifestyle change that makes a difference for people at the end of the day. And that lifestyle change would be portions. I, I noticed you've, you've got something over there that interests me. You have plates, dinner plates with food on them mm -hmm. in three different sizes. The plates are in three different sizes. Yeah. So Chris, you yeah. know this from I, being in a restaurant. I, I know this and we've tested this and my mom always tells this story about when she first came to the United States. It was the 60s and she had to get a set of dishes. They came here with nothing and she went to the local department store, whatever it was, and she bought a set of plates, right? And she goes, I just did the same thing recently and what I noticed was the salad plate that I bought today was the entree plate in the 1960s so that's the size difference so and the doctor did a great thing here showing these two plates together because this looks like a full meal it's one of the eggplant rounds on a nice small plate mm -hmm. and you look satisfied but the dinner plate which is now what 14 inches around and you look at this with one little piece of eggplant in and you think that's not enough and that is a big part of our eating right because we do eat with our eyes we've tested it at the restaurant giving people at a buffet a 10 inch plate or a 14 inch plate they will eat whatever size plate you give them 
And, and remember, it's a buffet. They can come back as many times as they want, but they will take one plate, doesn't matter the size, and eat that. And if you look at that, if it's a real buffet, that could be the difference of seven, 800 calories. So, Dr. Lewis, are we talking about tricking the brain? Sounds, it sounds like I'm pathologizing things, so I don't mean no. to do that, but yeah, what I'm is not it? A, I'm not a psychologist, so I'm, I'm not sure I should answer that question. But the, um, the study that I think Chris is referring to was a study done at Cornell not that long ago, and they literally studied 500 people and showed them all, you know, different sizes, same portion, different size plates, and uh, the size makes a difference, the color makes a difference, yeah. the background of the table compared to the dinnerware apparently makes a difference. Mm -hmm. I don't wow. quite understand that. the psychology that. of eating. Um, but it is the psychology of mm -hmm. eating, and... Because um, huh. we're uh, raised you, to finish our plate, right? Like, finish and, everything absolutely. on your plate. Yeah. No yeah. dessert, yeah. <laughs> unless you finish it's everything rude on your if plate. You, yeah. you never you know, miss dessert. Alex, I don't want to completely run away from this wine because it is delicious, and as it's mm. sitting in the glass, I can see it softening Opens up. and be opening beautiful. So you believe in this idea that when oxygen really connects sure. with the surface of the wine, yeah. it expands in its flavor. Do you Just like that? It, if you cut an apple and you put it on the table, it starts off as, you know, white. And then after a few minutes, it starts brown. That's oxidation. So it's the same thing that's happening in the wine. And they say it's been bottled up. So, you know, obviously it needs a little time to, to breathe. I mean, that makes it sort of like romantic, but I think it's more chemistry than that. We see people just taking the cork out of a bottle and uh -huh. letting it sit in the bottle on the table as if that will do something. I've never thought that did anything. What do if you think? You have to pour a little bit out because you see how the narrowness of the mm -hmm. top of the bottle where you're not making any air contact. So you need to bring it down to the shoulder of the bottle. So <laughs> now you have a lot more surface air, but I've never had that trouble. I was poured right away. <laughs> right in the glass. <laughs> Okay. I, I did buy one of those aerator things, and it does work. It, it does really, work. And I've tried it, like take a little out of the glass. Especially with it. your old wines yeah. that you have, Chris. makes a Chris. big difference. You know, one of the things that works about this wine is there's no sugar. When you taste French wines or Bordeaux wines, there's zero sugar. And that's one of the reasons I think it pairs well with food. And for me, I don't like sugar in my wine, so I like it when it's all I do too. bone dry. So do you find that that's um, helpful to have no sugar in the wine in terms of inflammation? I know that's not your area. Area. You're it's, a surgeon. It, it's, I am a surgeon, and I actually don't know the answer to that question. I, um, I know what I like, and um, this tastes and pretty good, do uh, you, do to you be <laughs> honest with you, Alex. <laughs> so, so I'm not going to put you in the corner of deciding whether sugar is inflammatory or not, although I think a lot of mice would say that it is. Go ahead. No, I have the perfect thing for this, right? So you go to the website, find that wine, then you find this recipe for the eggplant, and the, the salsa with the goat cheese on top, and all you need to do for dinner is grill a steak or grill a piece of chicken. Or and pork. Then, or pork. Or, or fish. Yeah, or fish. And you make this, and you don't even have to do the eggplant rounds. You can chunk it up, and you mix it all together, and you put that right on top of the steak, the chicken, the fish, have it with this mm. wine. That's mm -hmm. a perfect, that sounds perfect yeah, marriage. That's a perfect marriage right there. Mm. Perfect, yeah. sensible dinner. Yeah. I like that this is organic. Because as we know, there are more than a thousand things that Oof. can be put in wine that are not good for our bodies or our health, correct? Yeah. There's no labeling on wine, so people just assume it's grapes. And a lot of the industrial-made wines are not just, you know, fermented so, grapes. So do you have secrets for those of us who aren't that sophisticated? I mean, does it need to say organic on the bottle? Not necessarily. If you go to a wine shop and you can find wines that are from Appalachians, like Italian Appalachian, Spanish, French, or well-made small family producers, they are making stuff, wines that they're proud of. They're multi-generational, so they're very concerned about what they're putting into the soil because they know that a generation or two down the line, their family will be doing the same thing they're doing. And some of the younger people in the families that are taking over are so interested in organic growing. Mm -hmm. They care very much about biodynamic processes in Europe. So it, it makes a better wine. The microbes, so you can imagine like a sterile soil that has no microbes, no bacteria, and that doesn't produce better fruit than one that has a really rich uh, microbe and it allows like more nutrients to be uptaken into the vine, more minerals. And then when you taste and swirl wine and you, you're getting minerality, that all comes down to the soil. So you laugh at putting manure in a horn for, you know, biodynamic wine. It sounds so crazy, but it's a form of composting. So it makes better wine, mm. not just healthy.
So ideally, we would have this with a little protein mm -hmm. uh, with some body. So uh, in terms of fish, I would love swordfish oh, yeah. on the grill with this or broiled. We've forgotten mm -hmm. about broiling as, mm -hmm. as a substitute oh, yeah. for the grill. So if yours got packed away, you can always broil something. Um, what about striper? I yeah. was going to say, <laughs> oh, I, I yeah, just had a beautiful red yeah. with that striper, yeah. and it was a wonderful pairing. So, uh, Alex, what is this yeah. a, a bottle, by the way? So it's 19, so just under 20. I recently found a study that shows less money goes into marketing, all the sort of business end at that price point. So really in inexpensive wines, the money doesn't go necessarily to the wine. And wines that are very expensive, half of the cost, like a $100 bottle of wine, half of the cost can go into marketing alone. So the, the sweet spot for value is between 15 and 20. And this it's comes enough. in at 19. So 19, That's 20. such a smart thing to, to say and, and great to know as a person who goes out and gets wine just like everybody else. Hey, we're with Dr. Cortland Lewis, who is physician in chief. I was going to say <laughs> wine lover in chief, but that's okay. He, he is that. um, that's a new okay. title. <laughs> physician in chief at the Bone and Joint Institute here at Hartford Hospital. It's its own building, and it is staggeringly beautiful, oh I have gosh. to say. And this is what they are dedicated to doing. So there are a, a million of orthopedists like you running around this place. I've never seen anything like it. So why do this why concentrate on this i mean i have some rib damage at the moment so i'm uh well then you're you're sensitive to uh to fall prevention which is a big thing for us obviously so let's not do that um, but upstairs as we speak there are eight operating rooms going um, full speed we have 48 patients in beds every room in the place is full right now and uh, there are just a ton of folks with musculoskeletal problems and uh, given the demographics of Connecticut and all of the United States in fact um, as we look at baby boomers aging um, we are just headed for uh, a, a real big challenge in order to manage the the problems that they they already have wow so I, you know. I am so glad can you stay where right where you are in this kitchen chair absolutely and we'll keep going with this because I want to ask you about what it is in terms of the challenges that we're going to face what they are i mean the obvious ones would be hips and knees and ankles from all those sports diabetes so metabolic stuff on and on it goes so to have a place devoted to this this is valuable and we get to pick your brain okay uh, so we're going to be right back with more food schmooze don't go away I'm Faith Middleton with the gang, and this is the Food Schmooze Party, and we are at the Bone and Joint Institute at Hartford Hospital. It is brand new. It is gorgeous. There are orthopedists running around everywhere, surgeons and dietitians and nurses. Kim here has made this amazing food that we have on the website. You wouldn't feel deprived eating this food at mm. all. Mediterranean eggplant, and we're going to have parfaits in just a little bit. We've tried the wine, so thank you, Alex, for finding this. It's great. Thank you. All the recipes, everything on our website at foodschmooze.org. And, of course, um, we lobbied to have this happen. Dr. Cortland Lewis is with us at the table. He loves wine the way we do. He's also physician-in-chief here at the Bone and Joint Institute at Hartford Hospital. So... What is it that we're all going to face going forward? And can we prevent it through our eating habits or lessen the severity of, of things? Oh, I think that's absolutely the case. And that's really what this area, which is called the Center for Musculoskeletal Health, is all about. So it's called the Center for Musculoskeletal Health because our goal is to try to avoid problems that are not inevitable. So you can find folks well into their 80s, occasionally in their 90s out jogging, and you go, wow, how do they do that? 
how come their bones didn't wear out and their joints didn't wear out. I thought they had good genes. Well, they probably do have good genes, but they also are pretty healthy. You don't get to be 90 years old by having a ton of medical problems, and the best way to avoid those is to have a healthy lifestyle. So a lot of what our focus here is not so much on doing the surgery, which we're doing upstairs, because trust me, there are enough folks in Connecticut who already have the damage done, whether it occurred through sports, sports injury yeah. or a non-sports injury, or some of the point of our discussion today, um, they just ate too much of a good thing or a bad thing, uh, which would be even worse, and they have a significant weight issue. But excuse me, that can also be the, the gut biome for certain kinds of people, oh, right? So oh, absolutely. It's not and just, you know, some slovenly lifestyle. No, hmm. not, not at all. But I mean, I think what we do realize, uh, and we're seeing it now, in um, developing countries, China and India, countries that was never an issue where mm. as there's more prosperity, mm. there's more obesity. When there's more obesity, there is more problems with hypertension and strokes and diabetes. Arthritis. And, and mm -hmm. arthritis. That's where I'm going with so, this. So the, the processed foods would have more sugar in them. I'm not forcing you to say this, but in terms of going down that path, sugar I, I see sugar, yeah. mm -hmm. I, I see all those chemicals, that clean eating, cultures with clean, cleaner eating real whole foods, Mediterranean, without all this junk, seem to do better yeah. and, and somehow. And calorie dense, that's one of our problems, right? And when you yeah. look at fast food or processed food, it's not so much what's in them, it's, it, well, that, that goes into it, but it's how many calories are in this little burger. Like a how, fast food burger yeah. I can eat in two seconds and yeah, it's like right. 400 calories. Yeah. It's like yeah. when so you're faced a with a food desert, which exists in a lot of mm -hmm. uh, inner cities, probably yes. even more than in rural areas, um, you go, where is the good stuff? And it's almost impossible for people to find and also, healthy food. If you're on SNAP, in one second, your SNAP allotment is used up. And because whole foods, it turns out, are among the most expensive things, those vegetables and potatoes and things that you would love to buy for your family are impossible because you, you just run out of money. Um, what do you operate on? I operate on hips and knees primarily, so oh. I'm, a, I'm a total joint surgeon, and oh. uh, if you need uh, your hip replaced or your knee replaced, uh, I can be your you're guy. You're the guy? No, no, I'm trying to avoid you. <laughs> hey, well, can, I, can I ask a question about that? Sure. Because Listen, if you're very young, you might say, oh, this is the part where I'm going to shut off the <laughs> food schmooze. Don't do that because eventually everybody has this issue. If you have a foot problem, it affects the knee, and then the knee affects the hip. It just travels straight up. So everybody is going to face this at some point. Are there new procedures in knee and hip replacement that don't feel so brutal where recovery doesn't go on forever with, you know, agonizing exercises. Are there new procedures? Maybe there aren't. Well, there are, and, um, and I have several patients upstairs right now who had their surgery on Tuesday are getting ready to leave the hospital, and, oh um, and the agonizing Thanks. part, you know, for because sure. Because they're out of health coverage or because? <laughs> no, because of course they're not. Ready. They're, they're ready to go. They're, they're leaving. They've passed all the parameters. They're running. But, uh, but the Get point, out of here. I, I do want to make a point. The objective is not newer and technologically more advanced procedures, and we have all the gizmos and gadgets. Fundamentally, the surgeries that we do are salvage operations in many ways. If you get hurt or you get arthritis and you've treated it conservatively to the point where all, all the options are out except for surgery, mm. that's where it comes in. But it's a salvage operation. It doesn't make you whole again. Folk. What do you mean by that? It doesn't, so we can restore function very predictably, and, and that's a beautiful thing about being an orthopedic surgeon. Yeah. Um, people really do have a dramatic improvement from the surgeries that we do. But the objective, because we're, we're really thinking here in this space about how do we avoid getting into that in the first place. So we do know, for example, in uh, Hartford County, the single biggest health problem, barring, you know, it's not strokes, it's not heart attacks, it's not opioid abuse, although opioid abuse is a huge problem for us. It's obesity and the, the associated illnesses that go with that. Mm. So 
we know, for example, that every one pound of you puts three pounds across your joints every single step you take. And if you take five or six or 10,000 a day, that increases the risk of getting into significant problems. Like overloading yeah. a pickup truck or something yeah. with way too much weight yeah. and the shocks are gonna go. Yeah. And the um, pickup truck, you can always put in a new shock and-, yeah. and, it's, and it's the same shock. Yeah, it's exactly. It's not the same knee. Exactly, so delicious is a key word. I know deliciousness is important to you, mm -hmm. but also it is the portion control. It is really thinking about lifestyle mm -hmm. and how we can adjust our lifestyle in order to um, decrease the risk of weight-related illness. We are interested in deliciousness. When things need a little bit of a boost, either through cooking techniques, hopefully not through sugar, uh, hopefully not through tons of fat, but there are these tricks and these things you can do. And whatever Kim has done here in, in a, a association with your dietitians is absolutely delicious. I could make a meal of that Mediterranean eggplant alone and I wouldn't miss the meat for one second. So if mm -hmm. that will keep me healthy and is that delicious, I see what you're getting at here. Cool. Yeah. Some, but some meat will be okay. Yeah, right, no, sure. I, am, yeah. I am the meat girl. So. I often, I often uh, uh, you know, I want to preempt your closure, but when you say, uh, you know, never eat more than you can lift, my question to myself while I'm driving along is, does she mean with good body mechanics and two mm. hands, or does she mean just between <laughs> my thumb day. and my index finger? What, is, what does she really mean by Depends that? Depends on the day. <laughs> As Dr. Lewis knows, I have a little bit of a rib injury right now. Don't make me laugh. <laughs> um, well, we quote Miss Piggy just to be, you know, devilish. But I think we all try. We're just into real food on the show and real wine, having pleasure, but making food that's delicious. And so you're inspiring to, to, uh, to us. Do you exercise? I try to. I yeah. love that response from mm -hmm. you. As but it's not easy. Uh, and, and just like with food, if I tell you uh, you need to go out and jog 10 miles and you go, that's not my thing, um, it's really important to get into activities that you enjoy. It's also really important to mix things up a little bit because different sorts of activities put different stresses on your system. So I think a variety of food and a variety of exercise and being consistent and moderate about it is uh, is the key. Don't you right. love these vacations that are walking excursions through all kinds of countries? And then you stop. They take you to these exquisite restaurants the along the way. That's <laughs> yes. the carrot. Yeah. I just think that is the best. I love that. But you just you walk, kind of right? eat you whatever you, went you up want. A, you went up 1,000 feet in elevation, and <laughs> you did, get to exercise. Let's now you right. can eat. When you exercise, you get to eat more. That's also mm. part of the fun as well. Right? All right, <laughs> but, but here's the thing. Is it just eating more? I mean, sometimes I can't resist the engineering, the chemical engineers who are, let's face it, brilliant. And so they've got some bag of chips that are irresistible. My brain can't forget them, won't let me stop eating them. We all know what that feels like. I'm just like everybody else. And so I have to work at trying to overcome that section of my brain that says, eat this, eat this, eat this, mm -hmm. right? And you, you must too. Of course, absolutely. Yeah. I love that you say yes. that as a doctor here, as the chief. I, I really, really love that. Um, Dr. Lewis, let me ask you a couple more questions. Sure. And everybody jump mm -hmm. in with this. We see that enormous numbers of people have some form of arthritis. Mm -hmm. I've been reading up on it in preparation for this show, and so I've been looking at the connection between inflammation, whatnot. Are your surgeries arthritis related? Absolutely. That's exactly what I do. How does that happen? So there, there are a couple sort of major musculoskeletal health problems for folks as we get older. One is osteoarthritis, which is ubiquitous in the population, and the other is osteoporosis, which they sound the same, but they're very different. Mm. Osteoporosis is where you lose bone mass because your best bone mass is when you're 25 years old, and if you don't eat a healthy diet and you don't get adequate calcium and vitamin D, and you fall down, then you're at risk of sustaining a, a fracture, and that can be a devastating uh -huh. problem. Yeah. So that's a different story 
patients who fall and sustain fractures. Very different story than osteoarthritis, which is basically the cartilage that lines the end of the bone and allows your joints to be slippery. Your joints are mm. 10 times slipperier than rubbing two ice cubes together. Uh -huh. A normal wow. joint is extraordinarily slippery. And when it gets diseased and becomes less so and starts to hurt, that's when that's when it needs to be treated. And is that because the fluid has disappeared or that lubricates that joint? And why is that happening? Well, it's, it's more the impact on the cartilage that lines the joint, which is, uh, which is actually pretty fragile. If you injure it, it doesn't repair itself it's, very well. Is glucosamine, is that something we should well, take? Well, glucosamine is part of the um, mm -hmm. material that makes up your joint. But interestingly enough, in terms of treating arthritis, we never operate until as I think I said before, we failed everything else. Glucosamine actually has not made it on the list of guidelines based on the scientific literature. Okay. And I, I still take, I still you, take well, it. Well, that's fine. <laughs> and, it, and, yeah. you know, and, and my motto about that yeah. is if it helps you, that's great because there's not Enough. a major downside. Nope. If it's not working, save your money. Take so a trip to Aruba or yeah. something like that. <laughs> yeah. But not during the hurricane. Yeah. Right. No, so I, tried and true, losing weight, though, will help. That's losing just, weight? W just yeah. in general, if you're, if you're yeah. trying to be... Keeping as, your muscles strong. Yeah. So muscles are important as well. Exactly. So that's what I'm going through Why? now with the knee. I have a, mm -hmm. the same thing. So it's lose weight is the main thing. Mm -hmm. Exercise is the other. But the most important thing I'm going through now is building the muscle back up in the knee. Mm -hmm. So it takes the pressure off that joint. Right. right? So and that is absolutely effective and then you add anti-inflammatory medicine and heat and you know a cane or a walking stick or whatever to unload it and um, those oh. are those are all tried and true absolutely essential parts of treating those problems because the huh. goal well, you is, don't want to get there no that's what no. i'm saying We're the goal to is to avoid that. you that's yeah. my goal my goal is to avoid you right. <laughs> so that you is my in, message the for the day way. don't go but, there if you don't have to yeah. how do you explain that that some people who are thin have all these these same problems what well, is that uh, so osteoarthritis is not a specific disease it's a it's a family of diseases they all end up in the same place and absolutely, there are people who genetically are at risk or they've had an injury and they could be thin as can be. So I'm not saying obesity equals mm -hmm. developing arthritis. All I'm saying to you is that if you are overweight, then the stresses are increased and the likelihood of getting into big time trouble um, from a functional standpoint starts to go up and up and up. So here is my big question, okay. unfair to ask you toward the end of the I'll show. Take it. If you look at the world we live in, we are in big trouble in terms of, I mean, this is the stuff that keeps everybody up at night, right? Poison in the water, um, the products we make, off-gassing of things. We've got millions of cell interactions in our bodies. Any group of cells can just go awry and do anything. You know, people can look at that and understand that and say, oh, what's the point? I'm just going to have fun. What can you say to, and you deserve a Nobel Prize if you can answer this well, but what, what can you say in the face of people who just want to give up because it's really tough out there in terms of a healthful environment? Well, you know, a lot of this is interesting that uh, the principal determinant of how someone does after the kind of surgery I do is actually not do they have heart problems or lung problems or other things. It's what their outlook is on life seriously. Mm -hmm. So patients with depression and anxiety have the single, that's a single highest risk factor for the surgeries that I do wow. in terms of major complications. And so developing interest, developing wow. a regular activity program, eating plenty of uh, eggplant uh, prepared exactly like this. I mean, I think it's really all about those things together. But it is, it is people's sense of optimism, it's their sense of resilience, it's the fact that the hurricane's coming, but the world will not end. I mean, there's all this kind of stuff. Friendships. Yeah. Friendships, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. The yeah. social part is huge. Yeah. It absolutely is huge. Yeah. So, I wanted so, to do it longer. I want to be able to be here and do it for many more years. Yes. So I asked a family practice physician who sees both extremely poor people mm -hmm. and extremely well-off people in the city of Hartford. Mm -hmm. And I said, what is health to you? And he said, I would say whether it's a bee sting or a terminal illness, the ability to somehow adjust to the circumstances you're in. Would you agree? That's actually a pretty good answer. I do. Yeah. 
really great to meet you. My pleasure. I'm so glad you're here and doing what you're doing. Thank and you so I'm, much I'm, for being here. I'm just knocked out by this place. I really am. All right, my friends. Thank you so much for being with us. As always, we have a podcast at foodschmooze.org with all the recipes, the wine, and have loved every minute of being at the Bone and Joint Institute at Hartford Hospital. In Hartford this time, I'm Faith Middleton. Hey, thanks for listening to the podcast on your schedule. And when you need a little more party in your life, we're here online at foodschmooze.org. And we hope you'll talk with us on Facebook. We're at Faith Middleton Foodschmooze.